Why is it that I talk about history from the platform of a society for ethical culture? To me, it's because ethics is about the choices people make. And when we look at the choices people have made in history, we see ethics at work. We see role models, we see examples. So today I'm going to talk about many different women, and I have two reasons for that. One is to remind us that there's so much difference between individuals, even if they have some group name for them. Each woman I'll talk about has her own story, and each life is unique. And here in the Society for Ethical Culture, we honor uniqueness. The other reason is that so many of the African-American women abolitionists are forgotten when the story of slavery or abolition is told. Yes, you've probably heard of Harriet Tubman or Sojourner Truth, but they weren't the only ones. Why don't we hear of more? Why do we hear more about the white women who were involved, and more about the men who were involved, than about the black women? In the time when this country practiced the legal enslavement of those of African descent, women were also without legal rights that we would expect today. It was scandalous for any woman to speak in public. The few white women who spoke out against slavery were denounced for doing so. White women who spoke out publicly against slavery were denounced, patronized, and ignored. A public stage, one man said, was not a fit place for a woman. And for someone of African descent to speak out against slavery, that was even more dangerous. The risk of enslavement, of re-enslavement, especially after the Fugitive Slave Act and the Dred Scott decision, was real. In the Dred Scott decision, the Supreme Court of the United States of America found that African Americans, and I quote, had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. And so black women were especially at risk if they spoke publicly against slavery. The white men and women who spoke out for ending enslavement tended to be from well-off families. Some of the black abolitionists, if from the North, were from relatively well-off families, but race was, as it remained and remains, connected to economics. Fewer black women and men who spoke out had the means to support themselves and take the risks associated with speaking out. Race, sex, and class intertwined in what we today call intersectionality to remind us that all three of those factors had influence on the ability of people to speak out, to act on their own behalf or on behalf of others. Many of the black women abolitionists are and will remain nameless to history. In cities like New York and Boston and Philadelphia, unnumbered and unnamed black women organized to raise money to support the efforts to free their sisters and brothers still enslaved, freeing them directly or through legal channels. From the way history is usually taught in the North, at least, we tend to think of abolition as being about the fight that led to the American Civil War. But the first struggles for ab abolishing slavery were in the North, where slavery was also legal at one time. Vermont's Constitution of 1777 abolished slavery. Then Pennsylvania abolished slavery in 1780. Massachusetts established a constitution in 1780 that declared, quote, all men are born free and equal, unquote. But it took a court case to find that the constitution was, quote, incompatible with slavery, unquote. Anybody know what year the legal sanction of enslaving other human beings ended in New York State? Does anybody know? 1826. 1826? Yep. In New York State, they passed a law for gradual abolition in 1799. But that law accepted that anyone who was already enslaved would remain in that status. And it required that any children born to an enslaved mother had to work as indentured servants for years. It wasn't until 1827, on July 4th, that legally the last of those enslaved in New York State were legally freed. 
And so the first woman I'll introduce today is a woman who, like many who were enslaved, was given only a first name as a child, Vet. We read the children's version of the story here last July 4th, and some of you might remember that. Vet was born on a farm in New York State to a Dutch family. Then she was given as a gift at age seven to the daughter of the family named Hannah. And when Hannah married and moved to Massachusetts, she took Bet with her. She was notable for her mistreatment of Bet and other enslaved people in the family. Hannah's husband, John Ashley, though, was among the founding fathers in Massachusetts. Conversations about gaining American freedom from England happened in that house, and Bet could hear it. When the Massachusetts Constitution was established after the American Revolution, Bet heard it read aloud, including these words, all men are born free and equal and have certain natural, essential, and unalienable rights. Well, Bet took those words seriously. She went to a lawyer, Theodore Sedgwick, who she knew from those many conversations she'd overheard in the family home about, about abolishing slavery. She asked him to sue for her freedom. Sedgwick took her case, the court agreed to hear it, and the next year a jury found that the state constitution actually applied to her too. She took a new name, Elizabeth Freeman. John Ashley offered to pay her wages now that he could no longer consider her enslaved, but she refused to return to the Ashleys and to Hannah's mistreatment. She went to work for wages in the Sedgwick home instead. Elizabeth Freeman, the first African-American woman set free under the Massachusetts Constitution in 1781. Her case became then precedent for another of a man challenging enslavement, and it was his case that ended the legal acceptance of enslavement in Massachusetts for the whole state. Bat, who was later in her life called Mumbet, had a daughter who became a stepmother to a child, and one of that child's descendants was the famous historian and sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois. He thereby claimed Mumbet as one of his ancestors. So to move to another figure, one you probably don't know, Maria Stewart was the first woman of color to speak in public in America to audiences that included both men and women. Maria Stewart was from Connecticut. For her first 15 years, she was an indentured servant under that system of gradual abolition. She married after that and moved to Boston becoming part of the growing black middle class. When her husband died, his white executors ended up with most of his money, leaving Maria Stewart without very much. She was convinced through a religious conversion that God wanted her to be a warrior for God and for freedom and for the cause of oppressed Africa, as she wrote. She began writing for the abolitionist newspaper, William Lloyd Garrison. Her first essay was titled, Religion and the Pure Principles of Morality. Now the Bible had often been the rationale for refusing to let women speak publicly. Only white, one white woman had preceded Maria Stewart's career as a paid public speaker, and both of them were denounced as violating the Bible's prohibition on women speaking in public. So Maria Stewart first spoke to an audience that was all black women. She quoted in that speech her, the Bible in places where she believed it defended her right to speak. After that speech, she spoke to an audience that included men as well. She asked there if free blacks were actually all that more free than those enslaved given unequal opportunity. She gave only two more public speeches in her life, although she remained an activist. She supported herself instead by becoming a public school teacher in New York. Um, she eventually became an assistant to the principal at the Williamsburg School in Brooklyn. So another woman, this one you've probably heard of, Sojourner Truth, was enslaved from birth in New York. 
She was freed in 1827 when New York formally ended slavery. But by that time, she had actually already run away with her youngest child and was working as a paid servant. Sojourner Truth became a preacher. Then she joined um, as the only black member of a religious commune, returning to being a servant when the commune fell apart in scandal. She came to believe with others that the end of the world was imminent. And when the world didn't end, she joined up with a different commune, this one advocating for abolition and for women's rights in this world. She made her first public speech against slavery in New York City in 1845. She sustained herself through much of the rest of her life with income from speaking and from her autobiography. When photography became available, she supplemented her income by selling her own picture at her speeches. Her photographs are often inscribed, I sell the shadow to support the substance. Sojourner Truth included women's rights in her speeches from 1850. A man challenged women's rights by asserting that women were privileged in the current system when she was attending a women's rights conference and Sojourner Truth took the floor to talk about her life circumstances, asking, ain't I a woman, too? During the Civil War, Truth raised funds for food and clothing for the black soldiers who were fighting in the war. She met with President Lincoln in 1864, making the case with him for desegregation of public transportation. 1864, she made that argument. After the war, she helped raise funds to support black refugees from the South who were coming north. She remained active in both racial justice causes and causes for women until 1875, when she became ill. She died in 1883 in Michigan, still famous enough to have one of the largest funerals that state had ever seen. And then there's Harriet Tubman. I know our kids were studying about Harriet uh, a couple weeks ago. Harriet Tubman, as you probably know, was also born into slavery in Maryland. She was born about 1820. She was, as a child and young woman, beaten regularly and severely. She saw her siblings sold to the Deep South, and she even sustained, after a beating, a head injury that caused her to fall asleep suddenly for the rest of her life. She married John Tubman, a free black man in Maryland, though the marriage was not a very good one. When she heard one day that two of her brothers were about to be sold to the Deep South, and at the same time her husband threatened to sell her to the South, she decided to free herself. Her brothers refused to take the risk with her, so she made her own way to Philadelphia all alone. Over the next 12 years, she returned 18 or 19 times to Maryland, freeing family members and many others for a total of more than 300 people. The reward for her capture in the beginning was $12,000. It rose to $40,000. Meanwhile, she supported herself as a cook and a lecturer on abolition. She raised funds from white abolitionists for her trips to Maryland. She was among those who supported John Brown, but she was unable to be at that infamous raid on Harper's Ferry because of illness that week. All of Brown supporters who were able to be with him were either killed in the raid or arrested and most executed. Less known about Tubman was her career in South Carolina with the Union Army, acting as a nurse, a scout, and a spy, and also a cook and a laundress. After the war, she established schools for freedmen in South Carolina, though she herself never learned to read and write. Moving back to New York, she provided shelter for many former slaves who were aged and poor, dictated her autobiography, toured with Susan B. Anthony to support women's rights, and spoke at the first meeting of the newly founded National Association of Colored Women, a group that nurtured and encouraged a new generation of African-American women activists.
So next up is Sarah Maps Douglas, who I'm pretty certain you haven't heard of. Her husband, from whom she took that last name, was, by the way, not related to Frederick Douglass, although the names are spelled the same. Sarah Maps was born into a comfortable and prominent Philadelphia African-American family in 1806. She was educated at a school for African-American children, briefly teaching in New York City before returning to Philadelphia. The family were Quakers. Though critical of white Quakers, who, and most people don't know this, the white Quakers preached abolition and equality, yet still in their meetings practiced separation of the races. She got involved in abolitionism directly, and with her mother helped in 1833 to found the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society. She founded a school for African American girls, in the 1850s, she trained at the Female Medical College, where she was the first African-American student there. She's an example of one of the many free black women of the North who also worked for abolition. Others who founded the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society, the first integrated group for women abolitionists, included members um, of the Fortin family, including women. Charlotte Fortin and her three daughters from Philadelphia's black middle class were active abolitionists. Margareta Fortin taught, taught in that school, I said, that Sarah Maps Douglas had started. And she worked both for abolition and for women's rights. Sarah Fortin Purvis was a writer who published poems in the abolitionist press. A third sister, Harriet Fortin Purvis, with her husband, helped organize the Underground Railroad system that sheltered runaways and brought them north. Their niece, daughter of their brother Robert, was also named Charlotte Fortin. She's perhaps a bit more famous. She attended Sarah Maps Douglas' school. And during the Civil War, this Charlotte Fortin went to the coastal islands of South Carolina to teach formerly enslaved people freed by the Union Army. Many of these were called at the time contraband because those who escaped slavery were still technically property of enemies in the war. She wrote of her Sea Islands time after she returned north. She continued to work for education for the formerly enslaved. She eventually married Francis Grimke after moving to Washington, D.C. Now, Francis Grimke himself is an interesting person with an interesting history. He was a prominent preacher by that time in Washington, D.C., and he was a nephew of the famous white abolitionist Grimke sisters. His father was a brother of the Grimke sisters, his mother an enslaved woman. The Grimke sisters adopted Francis and his brothers, and his brother, um, once they learned of their existence and saw to their education. Francis attended Princeton Theological School and his brother studied law at Harvard Law School. Charlotte Fortin Grimke and Francis were guardians for a time of their niece, another woman worth knowing more about, Angelina Wald Grimke, Angelina Weld Grimke, excuse me, who was later a poet and a figure in the Harlem Renaissance. Francis himself, Francis Grimke, presided at the second wedding of Frederick Douglass, and he and his brother were founding members in 1909 of the NAACP. Now, another woman with a very different story from that of the relatively well-off black women of Philadelphia, Ellen Craft. Born around 1824 to an enslaved mother of African descent in Georgia, so from the deep south, her father was the man who enslaved her mother. Her father's wife didn't like the presence of young Ellen around the house, as she looked a lot like her father's family. So the wife gave Ellen as a gift when her daughter married, so she would take her away. Ellen met William Craft, an enslaved craftsman, but they both hesitated to get married, knowing that their children would be born enslaved. So they figured out an escape plan before they got married, and two years after their marriage, they were able to carry this out. Ellen, who was quite light-skinned, disguised herself as a white male slave owner, traveling with her male slave. 
Now, if she had traveled as a female slave owner, it wouldn't have worked because no one would have believed that a white woman would travel alone with an enslaved man. They took traditional transportation, like trains and ferries, instead of traveling on foot. Ellen Craft had to disguise the inability to read and write. Um, she needed to sign hotel registers as the slave owner, uh, but she put her right arm into a cast so she had an excuse not to write. <laughs> And then when they finally got to Philadelphia, they were welcomed there by the free black community and became part of it. But when the Fugitive Slave Act was passed, the families they'd escaped from sent slave catchers to find them. President Millard Fillmore even threatened that the United States Army would enforce the orders to recapture the crafts. So abolitionists helped the crafts to escape to England where they helped to sway public sentiment to keep England out of the Civil War on the side of the South. After the war, they returned to Georgia, <coughs> opening a school and buying a plantation. Their daughter's husband was later a minister to Liberia. And though I could talk about many more women, I'll end with Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, one of my favorites. Born to a free family in Maryland in 1825, she was early in life orphaned. Her aunt and uncle adopted her and saw that she was well educated. In 1850, after passage of the Fugitive Slave Act, she decided it was important to move to Ohio, a free state, because someone might allege that she was still enslaved and recapture her. Frances was the first woman faculty member there at an African Methodist Episcopal AME school, which later merged in, into what became Wilberforce University. Because free black women were by then prohibited by law from moving back to Maryland, Frances finally moved to Philadelphia, to Philadelphia and became involved in abolition there. She also published many poems, especially in abolitionist newspapers. Her poetry collection sold more than 10,000 copies, quite a large sale at the time. She spoke of the strange inconsistency of men fresh from gaining their own liberty, also permitting the African slave trade, giving in to greed. After the Civil War, Frances worked for equal rights, which for her included both those of what she called the colored race, and it included women. For the 1893 World's Fair, she worked against the initial exclusion of black women to make the Women's Congress there racially inclusive. Frances Ellen Watkins Harper was another who helped found the National Association of Colored Women, that organization which helped organize and inspire a new generation. At her death, W.E.B. Du Bois honored her especially for what he called her attempts to forward literature. Her work was largely neglected and forgotten until scholars in the late 20th century began rediscovering women writers and African American women writers. There are so many others you can learn about. Marianne Shad with her Canadian ties. Sarah Parker Remond of, Sa of Salem, Massachusetts. Women like Harriet Jacobs, who published narratives of their lives in slavery and revealed the scandalous secrets of sexual mistreatment of enslaved women, and so many more. These women flouted social convention and, and great risk to their own freedom, to win freedom for others. They demonstrated to those of their time that the myths of racial inferiority and gender inferiority were baseless. They spoke for the many who were not able to speak. To these and so many unnamed who also worked for the freedom and education of sisters and brothers known and unknown, we owe a debt of history to remember them and carry on their work. It may not have been a fit place for women, but such places are the right place to risk being when freedom and full development of a person's worth and potential is threatened. Felix Adler, who was the founder of the first Ethical Culture Society, said that the dead are not dead if we love them truly, and that we can love them by taking up the work that they have left unfinished. 
In the case of these black women abolitionists, we love them by carrying on their work that they began, work of freedom, of human worth, and of human connection. Thank you.